Welcome to the Contrarians, where we are right and you are wrong. I'm Julio. And I'm Alex. Here on the show, we rage against the Rotten Tomatoes machine. For the first half of each episode, Contrarians Corner, we trash the fresh red tomatoes and praise the rotten green splotches, making our case any way we can. The aptly titled Real Talk serves as the second half of each episode. This is where we discuss our true feelings on the movie we're covering. For more information on our podcast and to browse past episodes, you can head over to our website, wearethecontrarians.com. From there, you can also access our patron and merchandise, because capitalism. If you enjoy our attempts at comedic film discussions, we encourage you to subscribe and leave us a review on whatever podcatcher you use. If you'd like to reach out to us directly, that's what social media is for. You can find us on most platforms as at Contrarian Prime. You can also see what we look like if you go to youtube.com slash at Contrarian Prime, and you can contact us by email at wearethecontrarians at gmail.com. I think that covers it. Then it's time for the podcast. And we are recording for Contrarian's Corner for The Neon Demon. Hello, and welcome back to The Contrarians, where we're right and you're wrong. My name is Alex, joined as always by my Peruvian counterpart, Julio Oliveira. Julio, we actually have some company with us here today. We're not just a duo, but a quartet. Uh, But before we get there, you, Julio, know, longtime listeners know, people that know me, know that um, the MTV show Jackass and the subsequent movies that came out and, you know, all the offshoots, Wild Boys, Viva La Bam, are all very close to my heart. It came out at a time in my life where, you know, I was an impressionable youth and I had a lot of fun with my friends when I was 14, you know, 13 and 14, making our version of it in Waterville, Ohio, causing trouble around town. And it's something that's uh, I, it remained close to me into my adult years. You know, I, I talked on here about going to see Jackass 4 in the movie theater and but, you know, uh, it's not like the MCU where there's a constant, you know, just flood of content so a lot of times i have to revisit and rewatch what the the past has given us because it is such a a compact um franchise i guess for lack of a better word and as an adult you know the, the some of the things that i've come to realize are that, that i i have to find other things to enjoy about it uh be it the interpersonal relationships reoccurring bits you know ad-libbed one-liners from those on the crew or uh specific to this uh, steve-o is probably the one that has the most funny occurrences of this when he introduces a skit and he is so unhappy with what is about to happen that <laughs> he cannot contain his emotions or just his overall being you know there um be it t-ball or the the poo cocktail supreme is the one i'm thinking of where he's just like i'm steve-o this is this let's go uh and <laughs> That I never quite understood what it felt like to be in that situation until today. Uh, it took a lot for me to muster up my my cheer and saying, welcome back to the Contrarians, and not just saying, I'm Alex, that's Julio, this is the Neon Demon. Uh, it's been put off for nearly 10 years, uh, or excuse me, um, 16, so uh, eight years. It's nearly been put off as this movie caused quite a stir with myself and eventually you upon its initial release. Uh, but it's come to pass. We are here to bring Nicholas Wendig Rafen into Contrarian's canon. But we're not going to go in alone, Julio. We, we're going to have some help on this. Yes. Uh, and it did, that was a journey because I did not know where you were going. And for a moment, I was like, did somebody die? <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> and, but then as soon as you brought up the MCU, I'm like, okay, no, no, no. This is this is lighthearted. Uh, <laughs> yes. Okay. So, well, there's four of us. So if, uh, if you're Steve-O, Alex, uh, I know for sure I'm not Knoxville. We have we have two wacky, is it Australian Polish, Polish Australian, uh, Ryan and Bartek. What's, what's the right word? Bartek, you're an expert in the uh, Polish side of it. Uh, I'm the expert in the Aussie side. So please. Uh, I- but po- Australians, <laughs> we're, we're po- yeah, we're Australians. Sure, sure. Is there a word in Polish? Like, like, <laughs> no, sure. Is, I was gonna say, is there a word in Polish that's like a slangy term for being Polish, like how we have Aussies for being Australian? Was that just Australians love being like quirky like that? It might be more of an Australian thing. I don't really know. We just we just Polaki. Well, there you go. So we have two two Polakis. You guys know them. If if you've been listening to the show for a while, you've enjoyed their their appearances here and there Ooh. with with mostly really outrageous 
weird picks, and this might be the most outrageous of them all. Uh, but so we have Ryan, we have Bartek from the Spit and Polish podcast. We have you, Alex, and we have myself. So, Alex, uh, if you are Steve-O, who's Johnny Knoxville? Is it Ryan? Oh, I, I wasn't even prepared to go into this, but I'll just say none of us are Bam and none of us uh, are Ryan Dunn. Uh, so that's, I guess, Bartek and Ryan would be like, um, who shows up every once in a while in the movies? Brandon D. Camillo. Who's the confetti guy? Uh, Rip Torn or Rip Taylor? I'll be Rip Torn. <laughs> you be Rip Taylor. <laughs> there you go. Hey, we we did many years ago. We did uh, Dukes Beat of Hazard. It. He appeared in the credits of that. Well, I'll be I'll be Spike Johns just to close this conversation. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Julio, for, you know, jumping on the grenade of, you know, it's like saying I'm Preston Lacey because I'm the fat guy of the four of us. It's, so, such, a, uh, it's such a burden to be Spike Jones of all people. And I'm so sorry to hear about your loss. Which one? Who Who's going to be the Henry Rollins in that one appearance on Jackass? There you go. Yeah. Uh, well, Nicholas Winding uh, you just have to talk to me for about five minutes to know that I am a gigantic fan of Drive. And uh, in the second half, we'll get more into where this kind of falls in the uh, spiritual trilogy of uh, NWR as his watermark at the beginning of this film uh, is highlighted for us. Before we get into this beast, uh, Ryan and Bartek, you are reoccurring guests of ours, but um, let's start off by rolling out the red carpet for y'all. Tell us what brings you to us, what you do, where people can find you, and then we'll uh, go on this cosmic journey together. Sure. So Ryan and I are a duo of Spit and Polish Presents. Uh, we've been going at it strong since late 2015, so it's been quite a while now. We're older than the Neon Demon, in fact, now that I think of it. Uh, and we've been yeah, doing a film podcast all the while. We started off doing audio commentaries, which most of the films that we've done with you, we did on that podcast. This is the first time we're doing one that we've done on our current show, uh, Pictures Pow Wow, which is a bit more of a straightforward uh, review discussion show. Yes, we did this for one of our October movies, which is Spooky Month. We did it in that era of time in which we cover films that have a bit more of that that feel, not necessarily all horror. We've done erotic thrillers or you know just those kind of uh, eerie films. Anything or, that's or, like dark. Yeah, anything that you feel like, you know what, I can put this on at night with the lights off and just uh, have that vibe and out time. And it was a film that... I recommended, but yes, we host our podcast, Spit and Posh Presents, where we've covered a whole wide array from from children's films to, yes, your horror films or your sci-fi films, old and new. It's just been a, an absolute uh, wonderful time, and it's very much an excuse for Bartek and I to sit down and share some movies with one another. With our current show, we have a cycle of recommendation in which Bartek will recommend one week, then it's me, and then it's our listeners out there. And it's just been uh, a great time to engage with movies and see what the other people like. And sometimes Bartek will give me a movie that I've never heard of or just am completely unfamiliar with, and it will be two results of success or disaster. And then the same goes for me with him. And 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 we've just had so many uh, moments of, of joining together and ripping each other apart too. But uh, uh, but but then the Neon Demon is definitely one of those films where it's a tumultuous relationship was had. Mm, yeah, you can always tell when beauty is manufactured, and if you aren't born beautiful, you never will be. It's rotten, Julio. That's what we've come to find. Fifty nine percent, just on the border, it appears, based on two hundred sixty one reviews on the Tomato Meter and an audience score, a sad tipped over green popcorn bucket. Fifty one percent, based on uh, over five thousand reviews, ratings, as it were. What uh, what did you pull? What were critics saying about this, Julio? All right, I got a, a handful of rotten quotes, and you know, as we're talking about the the logistics of the Tomato Meter and how much people care or not care about it, you know that this just haunts Nicholas Wooden Reffin. That the neon demon only god is, forgives is lower it's 41 percent. yes but i think that there is a sort of a badge of honor if your movie's that rotten whereas like if you're like the middling oh. rotten <laughs> it's like the worst he's walking the the high wire here yeah. he's man on wire he, he stopped directing movies after this that's why he saw he saw that rating in the middle and said i'm i'm, I'm a tv guy now yeah you blew my mind on saturday <laughs> when you showed me the dvd it's like the newest film like ah oh, this is dated it's like no it actually isn't <laughs> No, he hasn't made one since. <laughs> well, here's some people that are to blame, I guess, for, for that loss to 
to cinema. Uh, we're going to start with Molly Henry from the blogging band She, who says, Neon Demon is a film that is visually stunning, but it is lacking in substance, much like the models the film focuses on. So Molly Henry has an axe to grind against models. Well, something to be complimentary of is uh abby lee is not an actress or she wasn't per se she's now uh in the way she is now but yeah before it looks like she had a part in uh, fury road oh yeah she was one of the um, brides yeah yeah is that the the blonde model or the blonde model the one with the big eyes the the blonde one <laughs> point being she was like a, a legitimate model uh and i was i was fairly impressed with her performance in this there wasn't a lack of substance here i wouldn't say that Next, Monica Reed from Far Out Magazine says the bland objectification of the modeling business, the self-loathing, self-mutilation, and desperation of the lovely young models are cuttingly satirized, but in a way that not only normalizes their attitude, but seems to revel in it. This is even worse. I, how could anybody watch The Neon Demon and think that the movie is normalizing <laughs> this type of behavior or this type of environment? Uh, did you guys watch the movie and they came out saying, wow, Nicholas Winding Refn really is encouraging young women to put themselves through the ringer for the sake of L.A.? And eat other young women to gain success. <laughs> yes, I, I think Nicholas was, in fact, promoting cannibalism. And that's, you know, I think that's a noble thing. I think that's a brave thing of him. Like that reviewer, I'm going to grab out a thesaurus as well and use fancy words one after the other to sound really intelligent and to fill out the word count of your needing of my response. But if I had to use any other things to describe the the idea of him glorifying this industry is, uh, look how pretty the movie is. That made That made me want to become a horrible person too. I thought it was a documentary, so it was all real. I... I had to check on it. I did like the portrayal of models in this is that they were still all blonde skinny bitches. 2016 was the year Ashley Graham was on the cover of the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue. It was time for women to take over, baby. <laughs> uh, all right. Next, Lisa Johnson Mandel from at home in Hollywood dot com says you'll find lots of blood and fashion here, but no characters who are even remotely likable or relatable. I can't imagine how this film ever got funded. How did this film get funded? Could it be... Uh, was he still writing the coattails of Drive? Of course. Like, could Drive really get at least two movies funded before people say, okay, yes. this is too weird? Yes. That's pretty much exactly what happened. Yes, <laughs> yes that's exactly that's exactly. It. He decided that it was, an, it was a classic. Yeah, you know, I mean, he decided that, and, and William Friedkin is, is dismayed even beyond the grave. <laughs> <laughs> so Drive on a $15 million budget made over $80 million, and then on an even lesser budget, uh, Only God Forgives, uh, was around $5 million, made around $11 million. But so you could, you know, Only God Forgives probably broke even in the end. Drive was a, a success, and that's... I don't know how that works anymore. You know, this isn't even ten years ago, but that's exactly it. He made Drive, and then only God forgives. It's like, oh, it's a misstep. So we'll, we'll we'll let him step up to bat again. He's bound to knock it out of the park this time. Well, Lisa, there's your answer. I don't know. I mean, if if we could come up with it in like two minutes, you could have done a little bit of research and just look up the box office for Drive. <laughs> after after she submitted the review, she's like, wait, that's the guy that made Drive. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> If only there were some right. visual and audio clues that it's the same person. <laughs> be fair, he's got three names. It's a lot to type in. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a, Nicholas. That's all. Um, we are going to close with Bobby Finger from The News <laughs> slash Jezebel. I'm not I making agree it up. with whatever right Bobby Finger says. <laughs> he's got his finger on the pulse. <laughs> there you go. Uh, he says, it thinks it can get away with its own contradictions by telling us we are missing the point. And maybe I am, but I couldn't possibly begin to care. That's that's an awesome review to where he says, like, he admits that the movie was too intellectual for him. And then he closes by saying, I don't give a shit. This sucks. <laughs> I didn't get it. And I don't care. We've all been there. We've all been there. All right. Well, those were the quotes. Alex, it's time to go to Contrarian's Corner. Who did you say shot these? A boyfriend? Not really. Not really or no? No. It was just some guy. He found me online. Be careful with that. Well, 
I'm not kidding. This movie, the opening credits has a watermark on it. That's a vertical NWR. And it does say Nicholas Wendy Grafen presents the Neon Demon. Fantastically, Keanu gets the end credit. So we're off to a good start here. It's uh, with Christina Hendricks and Keanu Reeves. And Keanu has a bigger part than Christina Hendricks. She just has the one scene. Keanu is on set for at least five hours. But I'm going to act as kind of the the guide through this, uh, the mediator of the panel, since we, we do have four people here today. I do have some things to interject with here and there, but uh, I'll defer to my co-host and our guests. Uh, the mood is set. Following the unexplained deaths of her parents, 16-year-old aspiring model Jessie, this is Elle Fanning, has just moved from a small unnamed town in Georgia to Los Angeles. She meets photographer Dean, who does her first shoot, and makeup artist Ruby, who introduces fellow older models Sarah and Gigi, who are interested in her physical appearance and in her sexual experiences, which Jessie pretends to have had. Gentlemen, the, the red-headed gal here, Jenna Malone, where do I know her from? She's in a lot of Saved? things. I know her primarily for the film Saved. Yeah. Okay. Where she's the lead actress in that, but she's in the Hunger Games and a whole bunch of th- other things. I'm pretty sure she's in the Hunger Games. I think I read that she's in a lot of Zack Snyder films, or is that someone oh, else? Oh yeah, she was in Sucker Punch. Sucker Punch, another American tour. <laughs> she nearly quit her career because of the failure of Sucker Punch. She was so disheartened at that uh, failure. So yeah, she's in Batman v Superman. She's in the Hunger Games. Yeah, she's in a whole bunch and. Uh, she was one of those faces. She was also like a child star, Inherent Vice, she was also in. So she's worked with like top tier directors throughout her career. And she was one of those faces in the movie I saw. And I was so comfortable. I was like, oh, it's that lady. Like, I've also had to look her up to be like, oh, yeah, what have I seen her in? But it, she, she's just one of those actresses that's appeared in enough things over the years that when I see her turn up, I feel a sense of security. Mm-hmm. And that's very good for her character because she's supposed to be this like the nice presence for our main character she's supposed to be the warm energy that's somehow in the cold la like in the icy coldness of the modeling world she wants to look after the fish out of the water yes yes that's exactly it and there's also just certain things about uh, jenna malone's uh presence especially even early on that is off and we can talk about that the more we get into it. But yeah, yeah. So she's been in a whole slew of things. As someone watching the movie, I too feel like a fish out of water. So I really need her. You want her to hold your yeah. hand? Well, she does serve that purpose. She helps us, the audience, feel like this is more than just a ice, icy place where only harpies and soulless people live. It's like, oh, look, there's a makeup artist. She's nice. I think that it's safe to say, though, Alex, that having seen her in The Neon Demon, Moving forward, that's that's what you're going to associate her with, right? Like there is no way that she can ever top this performance and the things that this performance demands of her uh, in future projects. Correct. She had a very familiar face, and I couldn't pinpoint what I knew her from. Y'all's rundown kind of helped out with that, uh, but but in the end, <laughs> yeah, you, you don't really forget some of the things that she does in this movie. You can't. You can't wash the neon demon off. It just stays with you forever. And. On that note, I mean, the neon is very apparent. I mean, the name, there's more in the name than just that, but it is a very colorful and vibrant film uh, from the opening credits through to the closing credits. What do you all make of the mood? Because, you know, that's something that as a director here, NWR definitely enjoys doing. If it, this, you know, spiritual trilogy of Drive, Only God Forgives, and Neon Demon, you could make the case that, you know, the mood is kind of the same in all three of them. But this definitely has to be the most colorful of the three. I would say so. I'd also include Bronson in this list of this particular neon visual style, too, and the very use of theatrics in cinema. There's a lot of heightened reality that you can see with the lighting or the blocking or the way the camera is framed that you would easily see on the stage. And I think, visually speaking, this is probably his strongest film from like a technical standpoint. The use of colors, the use of the cinematography, as also, I guess, too, you have to bring in the music and how it's implemented. I think from a visual standpoint, this is probably his most compelling. Like, he doesn't have a lot of dialogue in his movies at the best of times, and this is definitely one of those examples of you don't need dialogue to tell your story. This is an inherently visual medium 
you tell your stories through the visuals. It's not just Aaron Sorkin dialogue where you have to have like a million words in a minute to get your points across. And that's probably one of the things I would praise about the Neon Demon the most is it's not only comfortable and confident in its presentation, but it relies on the audience to get it. Uh, you mentioned the music, and yeah, he uh, paired once again with Cliff Martinez of you know, the previous two films that we discussed. Um, but yeah, back to the the peanut gallery here. The mood, the the aesthetic. What what kind of space does it put you in mentally? Was this a exclusive his exclusive depiction of L.A.? Because I don't remember if Drive and Only God Forgives take place in L.A. Drive well. is in L.A. Okay, and Only God Forgives. Well, no, Only God Forgives is in Bangkok. Well, I didn't know if it had like connections to L.A. to where you could like. Is this his L.A. trilogy? Like, I know Bronson isn't in L.A. at all, but. Uh, because I, I I get the feeling having only seen the movies once that uh, it kind of evolved. I don't know if it's just that uh, NWR has become more more critical of LA as he's made more movies, as he's become more entrenched in the in the business, uh, or if it's something that was planned from the beginning, right? That that with each movie that he makes, his depiction of of LA is going to be more superficial, more shallow uh you know just exposing what that city uh, represents for so many people because he nails it in this one it's like i said it looks great but it's also just everybody talks like in monotones and and they look dead behind the eyes and it's it kind of jolts you whenever somebody has a seems to have like a, a real emotion and it's i i feel like watching this it felt like this was the culmination of this is where where he'd been aiming uh to get from the beginning, right? Since he started with Drive. Drive is a more conventional story, but uh, and then by the time that you get to the Neon Demon, it's the plot is secondary. It's just more about how we're going to show this city that uh, he seems to have a very uh, complicated relationship with. You know, I, I would say love hate relationship, uh, which seems to be represented also by how his movies are received. So I, I it was it was really really interesting, especially factoring in what we know. Uh, of the filmmaker by now. What about you, Bartek? What does this put you in 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 for, like in terms of mood and and tone? I mean, recently, just outside of of what we've been doing on the podcast, you've been on a bit of a spree of watching movies a bit like that. You you watch some David Lynch stuff just in your spare time, and now here you are again with a, a movie maker who is very much putting emphasis not necessarily on the conventional three act structure plot stuff, but more on what they can uh, bathe you in in terms of mood and tone and emotions. It was a very short-lived spree, but yeah, I have been <laughs> kind of in that mood lately. And uh, <clears throat> you kind of nailed it before by saying that this film is kind of like icy. Is It does feel very cold. And even Julio before mentioned that there is a bit of, uh, you know, stiff delivery from some of the characters, especially the two more experienced models. And, you know, that kind of puts you in a bit of an unsettling mood because like, okay, yeah, they're saying polite things, but they're being very passive aggressive about it. And, you know, their intentions are very clear and it really puts our character who even the film describes is a <clears throat> pardon me deer in the headlights uh this sort of notion about them is is very present and it really yeah kind of puts you not only in her shoes but also in like the third person perspective of what's going on there and yeah it's like you want to you want to find some connection here but this is very much and i i I, you know, I don't know everyone's experience here, but like this is a world that we are not, you know, immediately in in our real lives. So no. it's it's us seeing this kind of stylized window of like the modeling industry. This has to wear a few different hats. To to Julio's point, there's a commentary made about LA and the director's relationship to it and how it's changed in the course of movies. But from a from just a purely storytelling point of view, everyone here. I think universally has a similar feeling about what the modeling world is probably like, that it's probably catty and vindictive and backstabbing and just horrible, horrible, horrible. We don't think, I don't think many people view particularly that side of the entertainment industry as just a fun old time where everyone's having just uh, smiles all around. It's, it, it, it is inherently built off the back of it's ruthless. It's ruthless. And the film has to convey that. It doesn't have to portray what could be the real side of that industry, but it does have to cater to 
what we view that as, as well as fitting that into the typical Nicholas Winding Refn uh, genre pastiche, and in this case, a bit more of a horrific leaning. This is definitely out of the three films. This is the one that is most leaning in toward, towards those uh, horror conventions, while Drive is a romance film mixed with a crime film mixed with a character study, and mm. Only God Forgives is a Oedipal drama. And then we have this one here that is very much spending its time in, in a, a certain certain place. And yeah, mood-wise, it, it does make you uncomfortable, but also reassured because it's like, yeah, the film is kind of giving us what we would expect from this particular line of work. I know we've we've done it here on our show, and probably you guys on yours uh, must have touched this type of movie here and there. You know, there's the movies, there's two types of movies when it comes to showbiz. The movies are about inviting people to believe in their dreams and go to Hollywood or go to Nashville, go to wherever, right? And just persist until they succeed. And and as long as you don't give up, you're going to make it. And then there's the other ones, the, the cautionary tales are like, don't do it. <laughs> you'll you'll come to this place yes. and they'll uh, they'll just chew you up and spit you out. So this one, obviously, very early on, you can tell that it's going to be from that second type of, of movie. And, and that's good. I mean, it's a very, very economical way of setting that up. It's a modeling world. It, it has all the horror conventions uh, uh, as far as like the aesthetics. And, and it has, I think, uh, perhaps one of the most important things is it has at its center uh, an actress that makes you care, that, that makes you worry, right? That you, you need somebody that, uh, in a horror movie, I think you need somebody that you are constantly worrying about them being in danger. And Elle Fanning has that that innocence <laughs> that it is exactly what you need for this type of story where she's just walking to the, the, the lion's den, so to speak. Black honey, plum passion, peachy keen, pink pussy. <laughs> What about you, Sarah? What would your lipstick be called? Fuck off. Act. You already mentioned uh, the way in which his characters speak and words are delivered in a slow, pausing fashion. What I realized in this, though, is uh, in this, there's examples in the other two movies we keep referencing, but it really makes it pop when someone has like a really terse response to something. It really sticks out. And I think that's, it's interesting. You can't write every, every movie can't be written and delivered the way that NWR's movies are. But like specifically, you know, everyone takes a 10 second pause between their responses, but, but here there's comes the part where, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Keanu like talking and what the fuck and that type of shit. And then the photographer who, the makeup artist is like, can I ha- get out? You know, he tells her to get out. It really, there's famously and only God forgives this part. I think it's the only part in the movie where Ryan Gosling like screams and it really makes it stick out the way uh, he writes dialogue. And I just wanted to get that point out before I forgot it. <laughs> oh, but to, to carry on to that point, what I think, and it's very deliberate in this movie, I don't think the the pausing between dia- like saying the dialogue and all of that is just... The, the the director using what he likes best. I think there is an unsettling quality to it, and it does not just carry through dialogue, but physical reactions, especially Jenna Malone's character. If you examine her, if you look at her through a microscope, if you just zone in, the way she responds physically is delayed in a way that makes you just tingle in the back of your brain. You may not even realize it, but there's just this building tension as the movie keeps going that that this whatever she is is an act in some way and it's just the little acting and directing choices like having the dialogue be spread out like that or just Jenna Malone waves at another character but she took just a little too long for the wave to happen and it's just just all of that just keeps giving you the foundation for the terror that will eventually unfold yeah and for a lot of the other characters there is very much a unsettling sense of being sized up like you know the the pauses with the more experienced models the two of them you know it's just like them coming up with their next sassy line or i'm thinking of uh i think literally that that uh, director character you were just talking about where um you know it's going to be the closed shoot and it 
the silence that that guy is giving is so uncomfortable and you are just looking at these shots of Elle Fanning, like, turning to Jenna Malone, like, what's, what's happening here? Is this, is this- Is this normal? Is this normal? Is this going well? And that happens, like, two or three times before the guy finally says, okay, let's begin. And, yeah, it's just- And then he says exactly what you know he's going to say. Yeah. Take off yep. your clothes. Yeah. <laughs> Bit skeevy. Uh, Jesse is signed by Roberta Hoffman. This is uh, Christina Hendricks's one and only scene in the movie. The owner of a modeling agency who tells her to pretend that she is 19 and refers to her and refers her to a test shoot with notable photographer Jack MacArthur. That's who we were just uh, discussing. The shoot is successful and Gigi and Sarah envy Jesse's youth. Jesse goes to a casting call for fashion designer Robert Sarno. We'll get back to him in just a moment where Sarah is also present. Sarno pays no attention to Sarah, but is entranced by Jesse's beauty. Distraught, Sarah asks her how it feels uh, to be the one everyone admires. Jesse admits it's everything, and Sarah lunges towards her, cutting Jesse's hand on glass. Sarah sucks the blood from Jesse's hand, and Jesse rushes back to her motel and faints, hallucinating as she is seeing abstract imagery. A couple things to break down here. One, this motel, the... (laughs) Dude running the premises is Neo. He is the one. It's Keanu Reeves. Yeah, Johnny Mnemonic. Yeah. <laughs> and honestly, I texted Julio about this. For as small of a role as it is, it's kind of singular. Keanu is usually the badass, or he has made comedies, so we can't say that he's not like he hasn't been a goof. But he's usually not like a dirt bag like he is in this movie. <laughs> And no, you know, I loved it for him. I, I wish he would do more things like this. In fact, I think he's transitioned to more of this type of stuff over the years. He he did the cyberpunk game where he plays a sleazy criminal dirtbag as well, for instance. Excellent. Um, well, back in the day, uh, he uh, it's is it called The Gift, the Sam Raimi movie? I remember when I saw that he he has a small part there, but he's uh, I think he's Hillary Swank's abusive ex boyfriend or husband or something, and. Uh, he brings that kind of energy. I mean, this is in Neon Demon. It's just kicked up to eleven. But uh, Samarmi Keanu, because yeah, you're right. You don't see it often, or at least so far, you don't see it often, right? He's he's the hero. He's Neo, John Wick, Ted. <laughs> but it jolts you when you see somebody that you're used to, even his his public persona, right? Like whether it's accurate or not, like his his image. Uh, in Hollywood, in the world, is that he's just this really nice guy, and so one of the only decent men in the industry, apparently, and a sad one too. That's also a part of it. Yeah, he the, seems like he a has sad that person. interview, right, where he's well, that was the main. He comes across as a little melancholy, uh, but yeah, so it has an extra punch when you see him be so despicable and just so nasty and sleazy, and uh, so I remember feeling it all the way back in the what mid nineties, whenever the gift came out, and and now here it is again. He. It's even. I mean, it's it's not just that he's lazy. It's just that he's dangerous. Uh, kind of like with the with what we were talking about the director, right? Like the movie sets him up as somebody who gives you a bad vibe, and then eventually the movie follows through and shows you that he is just as bad as you feared. And that's or great. I mean, fears, he doesn't at least, or, or she, she fears, fears because right. it plays with if that was real or not, which is interesting. But to even give Keanu some credit. He's kind of like what Brendan Fraser was at the beginning of his career, where we maybe forget that there was a serious dramatic actor there, not the action star or the comedy star or whatever the case may be. I mean, he did, um, what was that River Phoenix movie? Was it My Private Idaho? Like, he would Mm -hmm. do dramas and would- (laughs) Bram Stoker's Dracula, he's the only one not in on the joke in that movie because he's trying to be dramatic. Exactly. (laughs) But that's an example of him being a bad performer, but- the, the point still stands of he at one time would inhabit characters and for a large period of time now it's just it's Keanu Reeves it's Keanu Reeves and I know this is maybe more real talk here but I really think that this is some fantastic work from Keanu he really just brings it to this character that is such a small figure in this it's probably filmed for a couple of days on this movie and then left but he he changed the the resonance of his voice his physicality his haircut is particular in this with the beard i've only seen him with the beard and the long hair but I, there's just so much stuff he's doing here that i overlooked that oh it's keanu reeves and i was just more admiring like this character is just just so sleazy and gross and that's just such high praise for a person 
who has entered, I guess, like that Nicolas Cage realm of meme status, or we just look at their characters they play as just them at this point, like Keanu Reeves is Ted and and so on. And I just really thought he brought so much to a role that probably didn't require him to stretch his acting muscles. And this was also in a period of time where he was trying out weird weird roles they didn't work but like he did knock knock with eli roth for example like he was trying to do just weird things here and there to i guess stretch that persona out into something different which is commendable and it really stands out in this film in particular because you know we we've talked about how the big point of this film and probably the main thing we'll talk about you know in the future thinking back on it is like oh it's that satire of the modeling industry you know all the the cattiness the ruthlessness the this this that, this and that um but then this is a character that exists outside of that and it shows you yep. that you know even the real world itself within this setting isn't exactly, you know, great. Everyone's got a hustle in LA. That's that's what they're really getting at. Like to rewind to the Christina Hendricks scene, uh, she comes across as very professional. She says, don't do this, don't do that. You ought to be careful when you do these things. Like she's this voice of an uh, of wisdom for Elle Fanning. But also she's 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 got some hustle. Like it's her job. She's she's farming out these girls to these horrible people to get money. And when she walks out, she dismisses someone because they're not good enough. Like and it, I guess Christina Hendricks' character, as well as what we learn about Jenna Malone and the other models, is this is a movie that's not just showing the supreme awfulness of the masculine side of the LA scene, but also the truly uh, horrifying and vindictive side of the feminine in this industry. Like, women in this movie are not supportive of one another. They will literally eat each other to get to the get to the top. And Christina Hendricks, she she comes across as sweet enough in this movie, but also she's just as detached as everyone else. And she will dismiss you because, well, we found a 16-year-old who will do the job better. Oh, she's 19 now. <laughs> in quotation marks. Uh, I think a world where Christina Hendricks is the gatekeeper that decides who is attractive enough, that seems fair. I'll, I'll, I'll take it. It's, it's a fair depiction of LA and, and the world in general. But it's, it's good. It's such a generous performance, too, because... Uh, like we were kidding, right? Like she, she's there for like one scene. She, she nails it as we know she would because it's Christian Hendricks. But I think unlike Keanu, it's not like she, it doesn't seem like she's taking this part to prove anything, right? Like this is her doing NWR a favor. Uh, Keanu has something to, to get out of, out of playing this role in this movie because it's, he's playing against type. So he's stretching his muscles. Uh, Christina Hendricks, I mean, she can do this in her sleep and that's, that's great. You know, I'm, I'm actually really glad at the choice of her not doing it in her sleep. Cause I feel like you can do a lot more when you're awake. Thank you, Bartek. <laughs> when someone asks, I want you to say you're 19, always 19, 18 is two on the notes. No one's going to believe that. Honey, people believe what they are told. Speaking of stars, Keanu showed up as the star and he told Nicholas, I just watched that uh, Spring Breakers movie. I want to do some sort of scene where I molest someone with a weapon. That, that was his uh, <laughs> That was his one uh, caveat to doing the film as one of the dream sequences. He inserts a knife into um, Elle Fanning's mouth and a semi-phallic manner but that's neither here nor there what what is here and now julio uh i mentioned just a moment ago are uh acclaimed renowned fashion designer robert sarno played by uh alessandro nivola who is you're asking me because i i have a i have an answer but i don't know if it would be yes yours. i'm asking you <laughs> it's uh paul Troy. that's right sir what's the big deal it's paul Troy. <laughs> <laughs> that took me forever. I was like, ah, oh, because he's one of those guys. He again, he, that is a, a that guy right there. Because of course he's in um, American Hustle. Uh, he was in the, the Devil's Knot, which was the attempted um, dramatic awards bait film about the West Memphis Three. And uh, but yeah, I had to go all the way back trying to figure out what he is from. And yes, he is Pollux Troy from Face Off. He he does a little bit in this. He he's. When you're surrounded by as many enigmatic performances as this movie offers, it, you know, and 
in a very weird way, even though the message of this movie is all women are bitches and hate each other, it's still a movie where like the women are the ones that get to shine. So just another disposable dude here. It's not surprising that he doesn't necessarily stick out. Is he the he's the one you're talking about that is that main fashion guy that catwalk guy. the catwalk guy who who dismisses Abby Lee is like not even paying attention to her as she does her walk. He's just fucking around with his handkerchief. Yeah, and he looks up and sees Elle Fanning like he saw color for yeah, the first yes. time. Uh, give it to him though; he does have the most dialogue in the movie. The dinosaur. Yeah. <laughs> he has a dinosaur scene, so <laughs> evidently he's good enough for dialogue. So, <laughs> and he's the one that hammers in the point, the <laughs> argument of the movie. So, got to give him that at least. And I loved that catwalk scene just to to just to say we talk about how these other women come across as very heartless. But during that sequence, Abby Lee, who is a character and that performance uh, is very good, but. There is no there is no distance from how she feels. She's very upfront in her in her physicality and her dialogue how much she fucking hates Al Fanning. She doesn't like her from the get-go. She's there to specifically pick on her because she just doesn't like her. But during this mm-hmm. during this catwalk scene, she she you get a new side of this character where you almost feel sorry for her that she although she f- comes across like she's above it all she's just meat as well that's being picked by these faceless people these people who during the scene you have a person who's talking the entire time you don't even see her face you just see the back of her head and and it's just again like i i think like that scene is very important because yeah, you get the horror of it later where she Abby Lee cuts El Fanning's hand and drinks the blood from her hand like she's some kind of the vampiric youth. Give su- me the youth. Yeah, some vampiric <laughs> succubus. But this is the only time in the movie where that character shows genuine vulnerability and gives you the the needed insight that even these so called two dimensional people do have a third dimension. And it's a really sincerely hurtful, humiliating way to do that because, you know, it, it's almost like childish how bluntly he's not interested. Like he's focusing on this handkerchief on napkin, like so hard. And it's just so nakedly obvious. Like a child could tell you, like, oh, he's not interested. And then when El Fanning comes up, you know, he looks up and it's like, oh, now he's so obviously interested. It's almost like cartoonically dark humor yeah just how how blunt and ruthless this modeling industry this character is and then she gets a slap further in the face which is l fanning feigns pity for her and she doesn't she does she doesn't need that fake pity from l fanning and then l fanning just admits yeah i fucking love it i fucking love having the attention i fucking love having the power i fucking love seeing you down on your knees beneath me i thought it was it was just a good way to uh Got kind to of play with the audience, right? Because we've seen these models first and we've seen the way that they were treating El Fanning and you instantly turn on them. You're like, okay, well, these are terrible people and they're stuck up and they're just nasty. And then you get to the scene here with Alessandro Nivola and you just gain that understanding. I was like, well, that's why they're the way they are <laughs> because they, this is the, the system that they're part of and this is how they're being conditioned to to behave because this is you know, these are the people that are calling the shots. And so it suddenly adds an extra dimension. It it, it makes, I mean, you're right. It, it makes her slightly sympathetic. It's it's more of a, like, I can't say that I was ever rooting for, for these girls, but I was definitely pitying them more uh, as the movie went, went along. Ah, yes. The plight of the attractive blonde white woman. They're human too, Alex. If you cut them <laughs> as shown in this movie, they bleed. They do. At Sarno's fashion show, Gigi talks to Jesse about cosmetic surgery. As Jesse is closing the show, she has hallucinations of abstract triangular shapes and reflections of herself. After the show, Jesse goes out with Dean to a bar where Sarno negatively contrasts Gigi's surgically enhanced looks to Jesse's natural beauty. Dean finds the conversation unpleasant and attempts to leave with Jesse, who refuses, now espousing a narcissistic persona. Jesse has a nightmare of being forced by Hank, this is Keanu, the lecherous motel owner, to swallow a knife. Wider. Wider, as he says. <laughs> She wakes up to hear someone fidgeting with her door lock. She engages the deadbolt and hears the intruder break into the next room, assaulting the 13-year-old female occupant inside. 
Terrified, she calls Ruby, who invites Jesse to her home. Ruby makes sexual advances towards Jesse, who immediately rejects them. Jesse reveals to Ruby that she is a virgin, whereupon Ruby goes to her second job as a cosmetologist at a morgue and pleasures herself with the female corpse. Gentlemen. Uh, <laughs> that was a lot of plot right there. <laughs> he blasted through so much plot right there. But yes, a lot happens in the movie after some point. We didn't even talk about the big cat. I just wanted to get to that that morgue scene. Well, the first paragraph was stuff we already talked about with the diner scene well, and everything. Well, Bartek wants to talk about um, the big cat that enters Elle Fanning's room and Keanu has yes, to get it out with a big that's bat. That's way back in like the first is, 20 minutes. Is that a, a, a panther, a puma? Did it, it was a puma, right? I would have to take your word for it. We don't have pumas. I think it was a puma? <laughs> I wrote big kitty. I d- I just, I always think of Principal Skinner. Who would hurt a poor defenseless puma? That's the way he pronounces it. Always tickles me. So, Bartek, what do you have to say about the puma? What, what's it doing in there? Were, were you hoping Keanu would fight it? <laughs> would you hope that Skinny Pete from Breaking Bad would hit it with the bat? I haven't seen Breaking Bad. I don't know. <laughs> um, no, I, I don't really have too much to say about it. just that we haven't talked about it. <laughs> oh, man. I was hoping you had a, an interpretation because my note is literally... I may not fully get the big kitty symbolism, but I appreciate it. And I, well, I was, I was like, "There's gonna be four of us. Surely, at least one of us has has a read." My interpretation is it's her. Like that's her. Like she comes into this room, and there's this monstrous version of herself waiting for her in there. Because eventually, as Alex went through, she has this very hypnotic sequence with with these images, and she looks in the mirror and kisses herself, and that is a visual representation of her giving in to uh, the persona that's required of her. It's her selling her soul in a way that's her becoming the neon demon in the title. And from that (laughs) point on, she is trying to emulate what all of those other women are whilst also thinking that she's above them. And you have that dichotomy. And I think that that big cat thing is kind of a, a warning sign of things to come, just like how the other women are also warning signs of what she could become as well. Because you may not feel sympathy for them, but you do feel something about them. And a part of it is, oh, no, if our lead character stays in this industry, she will most likely just go through the same cycle they have gone through. There is a really big mystery also, you know, at the end of the film of like, you know, how innocent was Elle Fanning from the very beginning? Like, was there a, like, nasty narcissism there from the beginning? Or did she genuinely transform through her experiences here in LA? And you can then, you know, assign that same sort of mystery to whatever that big cat was, where, you know, was that a metaphor for her? Or was that a, you know, bizarre thing that can just happen in LA to make it just that tiny bit more dangerous? And a bit more foreign to her, because she's she's a fish out of water, as stated. And there was a scene, too, that uh, that was really key to the character, which is, her conversation with the the photographer boyfriend in which she mentions that she had this connection to the moon, that she would look up at the moon and call out to it. And it's it's basically her saying, like, I've always thought of myself as very important. <laughs> and that is an actual quote from Nicholas Wendy Rafin. <laughs> yes. that, that, that is something he said of himself. I can't sing. I can't dance. I can't write. <laughs> no real talent. And I'm pretty. And I can make money off pretty. Speaking of the photographer, Carl Glussman, that's the name of the actor? Did did he just have the misfortune of being eclipsed by Elle Fanning in every scene he had? And that's why, even though he does a great job, he is just not as memorable as everybody else we've been talking about? We could have a whole entire conversation about how men are used in this film, if you really want to. I mean, it's very deliberate that the men are underutilized people that they have a voice but it's meaningless in the context of the movie and that he is the only moral character and the film says no to him the film discards him and never looks back he's the one that you kind of see as the audience surrogate well i i thought it was interesting that you can't uh you can't really tell at least i couldn't if he was trustworthy or not I don't know that he's an audience surrogate, at least not at the beginning. Uh, At first, he could be just as as much of a predator as everybody else in the movie, right? Like even when he he kind of acts bashful and uh, reluctant once he finds out how old she is, 
I mean, that could be an act. We don't really know, right? He acts that way for 10 seconds, then he's like, <laughs> oh, it is but LA. Isn't that the argument in the diner scene from the fashion designer? This character, this Dean, is saying all of these things that we, the audience, probably feel. But he's also a part of everything. This is a man who, who is using her to try and benefit his own career as well, and also she's a pretty young girl that he would most likely never get a shot with if it wasn't for the power dynamic that they started with. Now she's moving out of that. And that's the fashion designer's big critique to make is you wouldn't be here if it wasn't for her beauty. You would never have given her a second look if she wasn't hot. Beauty is everything. And he says, no, it's not. And then he has no argument to make because he's doing exactly what both of you are saying. He is feeding into the narrative. He does play bashful for like 10 seconds, but then he gets over it. There is no qualms about dating a 16-year-old girl who's on her own, as there was no qualms for uh, uh, with Hendrick's character employing a 16-year-old girl who's on her own. So he's a piece of shit. He's not a, an audience surrogate. Bartek, what are you talking about? I stand by what I said. <laughs> Because maybe we, the audience, are a piece of shit. Maybe we, the audience, feel uh, what Dean is saying, but then the movie is challenging you on if how true is that? How far does that go? Is that the truth of reality in the film and also in real life? You have to wrestle with it. That's the point. That, that is a big point of the film. It is the fact that you have to wrestle with, like, you know, is this normal? Is this truly the way that you know the world works you know is beauty everything and i say that he is an audience target because in that diner scene even if he was ineffective in his argument he was actually trying to say you know some of the things that we might be thinking like okay what would these characters think towards you know the beauty is on the inside uh value that a lot of us have and he says it very plainly and, you know, he, he isn't challenged immediately on it. He has to establish uh, or, or elaborate, sorry, on it. Um, and that is why I think that he acts as that kind of surrogate. He doesn't fully play into the, oh, it's all about exterior beauty. Um, that's, yeah, that's why I said what I said. All right, gentlemen, we've delayed it long enough. Let's get to this uh, necrophilia scene here. <laughs> um our patrons will know this, and it's probably been mentioned on some uh, main timeline episodes as well. My my mom's been living uh, at my house recently just uh, due to some life situations. My dad's here too, so I don't want to sound cryptic. But um, So part of it is to kind of help occupy her time. It's whenever I do movies for the podcast or whatnot, or just watch anything. I've got her. She binged Magic City, that show with Jeffrey Dean Morgan, and now she's watching Glow. And But anytime I do a movie for the podcast, she asks if she can watch it with me. And I told her, I was like, well, this movie's pretty weird. It's pretty out there. <laughs> Uh, and she's like, yeah, I'll just be on my phone. And then, of course, this scene is when her phone's charging and she's paying the most attention to the screen and watching it and questioning what I do with my life when I go into my room and talk to my friends about movies. But uh, it's so um, she liked it then. <laughs> she was she to her credit, you know, in her defense and also her being a good sport, she was trying to figure out what it meant in terms of the movie past just, you know, my dad would be like, this is stupid. And my mom was trying to like, you know, kind of make sense of what it was. And um, I found myself unable to give her much guidance in what this what the sense of this is, other than my entire read on this movie was different this time around of thinking that the three models that, you know, f form themselves around Jesse uh, are witches or yes. of some cult and that this is some sort of ritual that was the most sense i could make of it so once again i throw it to the room for interpretations that's always been my read as well that there's a very much a, a witchy pagan or occult type uh feel to those characters and that's definitely emphasized with the triangle images during jesse's transformation during that uh, fashion show and with the necrophilia scene i don't know what the read on it is because i when I watched the movie, I was like, I've got to read the trivia on this. And I knew that there would be some trivia facts about that scene. And the trivia facts about that scene make me like not sure of what I can make as an interpretation of it. Because like once you kind of know, it makes it like, okay, so if that happened, then what does that mean? But if I have to try and just look at it purely from the film standpoint, I think 
more so than it being a ritual, I think it's a release of this character's depraved sexual nature because Jenna Malone's character is the nice one. She's the normal one. She's the friendly one. She's not a model. She's a makeup artist. She's the one that's an in-between for everyone. She's on all of the jobs, unlike the models. And I thought of her being rebuffed by Jesse as this as this like grave wound to her. So she's going to unload all of this sickening stuff inside of her, not onto Jesse, but onto literally anything she can. And it just happened to be a corpse this time around. And that's my gut feel read on just looking at through the prism of the movie, not any of the external factors that went into making the movie. What about you, Bart? Like, I mean, this is like one of the most like fucked up scenes we've had to watch on our podcast as well. Like in terms of like, we haven't had many corpse fucking scenes. And this is one where it's like, it doesn't cut away. It's not like, oh, it's implied. We watch it. <laughs> well, yeah, it, it's clearly, you know, she has been scorned. Um, and she is still not over it. She's still thinking about uh, the Elf Hanning character, um, and she turns to the body that she has access to and thinks about her while doing things to the body. Yeah, I think it's a bit of a projection of what she would want to do with Jesse. Julio, I mean, you love this scene. You always talk about this scene. You always say... Oh, when Jenna Malone fucked a corpse, that was when the movie really peaked. <laughs> that's really that's He does it. send me gifs from this scene just too often. Like we won't even be we'll be like, "Hey, who's editing this?" and he'll just send me a gif from him. I'm like, "All right, man." I get <laughs> because it. you can interpret it so many ways. It's just like a multi-purpose <laughs> meme. Um see, I like the idea it, it, I think that yeah, there's there's something to the idea of of uh, them being witches and there being some sort of uh, not even supernatural, but just this, this cult, right, going on in the, in the story and I, I think that's valid. I, I personally like it more if it's just a, a more grounded, straightforward interpretation, which is that kind of like what Bartek was saying, right? Like she was horny. <laughs> and and then she the this system that they're part of, this city, has corrupted their lives, their sexuality, their desires so much that at this point it's just you you just grab for release wherever you can get it. You know, and and I can't tell you at this point if we're watching Jenna Malone break at this point in the movie or if we're just seeing what she always was. And it was just that she's been pretending through most of the movie that she was the the sensible one or if it was just the only she was just out of that group. She was the only one that had enough social graces to where you couldn't tell uh, that that she was just as damaged and as disturbed as everybody else. Uh, but whatever the case in this scene you just she just completely uh disconnects from what we perceive as normal <laughs> and it, i mean it's it's memorable i think that it it definitely it's a good transition to what's going to happen <laughs> in the last 10 minutes 15 minutes of the movie it's like you need this this is just uh nwr just kicking the door open and going like all right all bets are off you have no idea what's going to happen if you uh remove the scene or if you softened it by by making it an implied act instead of making it so explicit i think that you would have a harder time getting to the end of the movie the way that he has it thank you for what for being so good to me it's what friends are for Ruby returns home, where Jesse encounters Sarah and Gigi, who, along with Ruby, chase Jesse, causing her to fall into a deep, empty pool. Uh, this states it as though it happens in the movie when, when it doesn't. It's You kind of have to piece it together for yourself here. But the women butcher Jesse with knives and consume parts of her body before bathing in her blood. I mean, we see the, the bathing, but uh, Ruby is revealed to have occult tattoos. She lies in Jesse's unmarked grave and later nude in her house. As the verbiage on this, as a torrent of blood gushes from her genitals. With the full moon. Again, the moon imagery there. Yeah. Uh, this scene is easily the most horror inspired of the whole movie. I mean, this there are like 70s exploitation type aspects throughout this movie. But uh, this, this is a little bit of real talk. This is my favorite scene in the whole movie where they chase jesse through the house before they're finally able to corner her and kill her 
in your typical horror movie, this would be accompanied with, you know, Ben and Nana Nana or the god awful score of Halloween H2O or Rant, 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 Rant. Heather's <laughs> school. Heather's. <laughs> yes. uh, but here it's just <laughs> yeah. until they actually confront her, she's just kind of running through the house screaming in silence, which makes it a lot more haunting. But yes, Elle Fanning, we hardly knew ye. It comes to this where the three gals kill her and that's somebody's blood they're bathing there's in a, but there's, there's humor to this as well because the neon demon has a dark humor underneath a lot of this bartek was touching upon that earlier in the conversation but there's a little bit of humor of l fanning is wearing this beautiful gown as she's been slit on like the side of her arm or wherever and she's like limping but she's taking longer they're both they're all taking a long time to get to each other because they're wearing these fucking big heels and they're just clip clopping and there's a little bit of humor to that and there's humor to l fanning's vision as she's dying like going in and out of focus and all she sees is these three attractive women walking down the pool like they're on a runway to slice her up and there is a deliberate sense of of cheekiness to using the aesthetics of the modeling world and bringing it into the horror world and that definitely definitely is on full display in the final scene of the movie the morbid humor of this caught me when i believe it's supposed to be the next day or whatever and jenna malone is watering the plants at the house she's house sitting (laughs) at and we don't see it but she clearly finds like a patch of blood or viscera somewhere on the sidewalk and just turns the hose on and starts hosing it down like you know you would if you are closing a gas station hosing the sidewalk Mm -hmm. off it's like a pov shot of whatever it is and I do love there is a bit of a, not only is it revealing of character, but I get a bit of a chuckle that once we see Jenna Malone with her clothes off, she has all of these tattoos that just give you the sense of who she really, like who this character is supposed to be. Just like these these kind of like witchy, occulty tattoos. And you're like, oh, of course, we, we didn't see those earlier. But once we are revealed, you are really revealed. She's got her nips colored in, man. She's got the both of her nipples completely tattooed. No um, half measures. Julio, how did they get L. Fanning's blood supply to run through the water system in the house so that it showered overhead? Well, if we're going with your theory that this is an established operation, then this is probably not the first time that they've done it. So they've had time it's, to really if perfect. If Julio knows one thing, it's residential plumbing. <laughs> yes. I think that they they already have all this set up. And uh, they just, once you kill them, you just feed them through the machine and then you just just go to town on, on the with the bathing. Uh, this is, look, we can theorize about what exactly means, what really happened, what happened in a character's mind and what exactly we are not seeing, you know, what's happening off off screen. But I think that the one thing that is very clear that this is kind of undeniable is that Nicholas Winden Refn had, for all the symbolism that is uh, that he puts in this movie and his other movies, you know, this is this is not subtle. <laughs> but time that you get to the end, and it shouldn't, right? Because it's meant to be a warning. If if this movie is a warning uh, regarding LA regarding the industry, then it can't really afford to be uh, very vague or ambiguous about what it's saying. So whatever uh, ambiguity, whatever preciousness it had in the previous like hour and 20 minutes or whatever, it's just abandoned in this climax where if, if you were not sure whether these women in this city were toxic and a danger to our protagonist, well, this puts it in full display and and that's really all that matters right and then everything that happens after like the epilogue the last five ten minutes and that's that's finally what i i think appreciate the most more than anything else in the movie is just that this filmmaker set himself a mission he was on a mission he had a goal and at the end he could have gone in in a much more oblique way about sending his message but he embraced the outrageousness of just putting it out there la is bad for you (laughs) Yes. The modeling industry is bad for you. Show business is bad for you. Run away or you're going to get eaten. <laughs> Literally. I, yeah, I think that's lack of the drop of subtlety there is just a result of what you need for this type of feature where it's been slow, 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 dreading, slow dread just building up. 
you know as a viewer at home that at some point the shit is going to hit the fan and with the aesthetics and the characters and the director behind it and so many other things, it's going to go for the jugular. It's going to go absurd. It's going to go gonzo. It's going to go up there. There are many other movies that do this, like a film that I think pairs beautifully with this is Starry Eyes, which also does yeah. that. But heck, even in more conventional films or, or ones that come a bit later, like uh, Halloween Ends. Halloween Ends is like a slow brooding character drama, blah, blah, blah. And then it becomes the gonzo thingy that you're here for and maybe that works maybe it doesn't uh it's a case by case basis but i think what you're saying julio is just uh the nature of the beast of what this story and what this tale needs and we can talk in real talk if if it goes too far or too little with the subtlety at the end or if it even matters but i think it's all key to like that is just how these things often play out and for the average viewer at home they're like i want to the, the the gonzo violence that I know this director for. Like, I want the head stomping scene from Drive. Damn it. Where's that? He says violence, <laughs> motherfuckers. Yeah, instead of saying cut or action, he says violence, motherfuckers. That's this director. So I want that shit in the movie. And you get it in spades. And so you get like them bathing in blood. And it's like, yeah, how does it work logistically? Who cares? Run away from the runway. <laughs> <laughs> The next day, Sarah and Gigi attend one of Jack's shoots with another model named Annie. Jack is suddenly enthralled by Sarah and fires Annie. In the midst of the shoot, Gigi runs off set suddenly ill. Sarah watches Gigi vomit up one of Jesse's eyeballs. She screams with regret, I need to get her out of me, and stabs herself with a pair of scissors. Straight up like hot a kitty here, man. It's fucking vicious. Uh, Sarah watches Gigi die and eats the regurgitated eyeball before returning to the shoot. In the end credits scene, a woman whose face is not shown walks alone in the Mojave Desert, much like Dave Bautista walks alone. (laughs) And uh, this coming off the heels of uh, watching Black Christmas from 2006, you know, I became a bit desensitized to eyeballs getting ripped out and eaten. Um, But this is not digested. It comes out just perfectly circular. I like I, I know. Physically, it would have made no sense. I could have used it like looking up at uh, <laughs> blinking. Sarah and blinking. <laughs> but, or crying you know, it, or crying. It's a bit too much to ask. Or, <laughs> yeah. or like making an angry. Or doing the thing where like angry it, eye. It, it looks to each side, like get me out yes. of here. A second eye pops up. You ever had a girl screw you out of a job? Yes. So what'd you do about it? I ate her. Well, you know who feels more guilt than any character in this movie is me for pretending like this movie is anything above awful for the past hour and 20 (laughs) minutes. And he's really been doing good at that. uh, He's really tried. It seems like we're going to have a spirited and fun discussion and real talk. So gentlemen, let's move it along to real talk. Let's do that. (laughs) 